Welcome once again, everyone, to the Conversations That Matter podcast. I'm your host, John Harris, and uh, we're going to talk about a an organization that I haven't mentioned, uh, at least often. I, I may have, in passing, mentioned the Evangelical Free Church before, but we're going to actually talk about the Evangelical Free Church today. And I have had emails and questions about whether or not this particular organization or some, some considered a, a denomination has, um, uh, whether it's gone woke, social justice, all of that. And I haven't known how to answer that because I haven't researched it deeply. But today we have with us uh, Pastor Craig Chambers, who is the pastor at the Peak Evangelical Free Church in Pueblo West, Colorado. And he recently returned his ordination. He's been in the Evangelical Free Church for about three decades and uh, as, as a uh, working in, in that particular um, organization. And so this is kind of a big deal. He has researched it and he has extensive notes and sources. If you want to reach out to him, his email is in the info section and you can do that and you can get a hold of all of those, those uh, sources and notes. But I just like to start off by thanking uh, you, Pastor Chambers, for being brave enough uh, to and gracious enough to um, answer the invitation that I extended to you to be on the, the uh, show today. Thank you. I appreciate it, Tom. So, um, so let's start with uh, just your story a little bit. You just returned your ordination, and after uh, being in the church for decades, I, I would think that would be a difficult thing to do, and probably not a decision that you took lightly, I would imagine. No, it wasn't. In fact, uh, it took me nine months from the time I really understood some things were going on with the you know, free church to the time I actually returned my ordination, because I wanted to take my time. I wanted to look at what the evidence was. I don't want to have any kind of false things said. And I will say from the outset, I consider uh, the leadership of the EFCA to be brothers. And so therefore, uh, I, am, I deal with them as brothers. Uh, but I, by necessity, wrote a, it had to be a strongly worded kind of document to say, here's what is wrong and, and what you need to repent of. And uh, so this is... Um, this is something that uh, uh, just came about because I ran up into what was happening in our country, what was happening in the, the believing world. And, uh, and so I, I, I just uh, finally figured out I needed to, to explore all these things. Yeah, well, I'm glad you did. Um, man, it's there's so much information and I'm sure there's even more than you uncover that could be oh. talked about. And, and I'm sure we'll just hit the high points today. What was the first thing though, for you that you, uh, that made you question uh, whether or not the, the evangelical free church was going in the right direction? It's been a long kind of process uh, in terms of uh, understanding what was happening with EFCA, because I, I've always met with all my brothers, you know, in terms of pastors and we have these meetings all the time, and we have we have it. I'm going to explain EFCA in a moment, but just to kind of give you that story of what got me looking, uh, we have uh, a district superintendent uh, with uh, pastors, and we would meet in different locations. Ours is the southern part of Colorado, and so we have um, uh, a meeting. And in those meetings, uh, there was a difficulty between that I knew I was aware of, I could sense it uh, between the district superintendent and I and, and maybe a couple pastors as well. I just didn't know what was wrong. And so I usually work, you know, look at myself first and that's what I did. And this has been over a period of 17 years. And in doing so, I just kept recognizing there's pragmatism here. And finally, uh, what turned on my light bulb was last fall or a year whatever. It was a period of time where it got me started, uh, probably in the spring of 21. And then that's where I finally uh, came to my conclusions to look into it deeply in, around November. But in the spring of 21, he turned to me and, and said uh, a, a disparaging remark about John MacArthur, because I really appreciate John MacArthur. And he said, um, John MacArthur thinks the Bible sufficient for everything. And, of course, he was criticizing me for thinking that the Bible is sufficient for all things. And I think it is. And so it was, I, I finally figured out it was the pragmatic view that he had that uh, uh, I, I wasn't going along with the program. 
and he didn't like me for that reason. And not that he didn't like me personally, I suppose, but he just didn't like me for that reason. So that's what really got me. It just clicked. And that's when I began to start to study what was happening. And, uh, and so here I am. Wow. So you, you, you're, you're, the light bulb went off and you thought, wait a minute, or went on and you said, I, I need to look into this more, see what's going on. Pragmatism was kind of the first thing, mm -hmm. but this has gotten into the social justice stuff. I mean, that's where it's led you and you've seen um, some evidence that uh, the, the church is, is going in the social justice direction. Um, I know you, you had said you wanted to explain because it's relevant for this uh, kind of what the uh, the nature of the organization or denomination, or, you know, I don't know how exactly you categorize the FCA, but, um, why don't you do that? And then, and then maybe explain to us kind of where, where have they gone social justice kind of, where's the beef here? Uh, you're not just saying that, obviously you have, you have sources that are, um, uh, point in this direction. And I have to say social justice is not the main thing, but it is a big thing. And we'll get to those those points. But uh, starting with the Evangelical Free Church, uh, the EV Free Church, that's a short way of saying the Evangelical Free Church of America, came about from a mixture of people who, who found it difficult to remain in, in Europe in their status churches. Now, back in Europe, you have churches are sponsored or supported by the state um, in earlier days, right? After the Reformation, after the battles and the things that took place, uh, everybody took sides. And so uh, you have England with the Anglican, you have um, uh, Belgium and uh, Germany and all the different countries there. You would divide up between Catholic and the Re Reformation folks. Well, in Sweden and in Norway, you had uh, two different groups because two different countries and the state supported the state religion. And of course, so that would be the Lutheran church uh, there. And people who wanted to not be entangled with the state government through entanglement with the state church left the state church and started what they called free churches. And that's what it's known in, in Europe is if you're a free church person, you're not attached to a, uh, a, a church that is supported and uh, entangled with, with the government or with the state church as well. So that's what it meant to be free. So when we say evangelical free church, they came over here and by the time 1950 rolled about, the Norwegian folks and the Swedish folks joined together and decided to create this uh, evangelical free church of America. And uh, so when they did that, what they meant by free was that they were not going to take state supported funds or be part of a, a state religion. By religion, mean the religion of Christianity, but the state's version of it. And so um, that's what made them free. And the second thing, though, that makes them free in their minds is the fact that um, um, they uh, were congregational uh, in every church so that the church was free to determine their own faith and practice and uh, within certain boundaries. So each church is autonomous in the evangelical free church, uh, but interdependent. Um, and so to remain clear about this, they're a bigger tent um, in regards to both theology and practice. Um, so each church can lean one way or another on many issues like uh, baptism. Some are pedo, some are credo. I would be credo, of course. And then having an Armenian or Armenian or Calvinist view, I'd be Calvinist in my views. Each, each, uh, each church can hold um, or, you know, one view or practice, but every church has to allow for any other evangelical free church that a person that's a member of one goes to somewhere else. You have to allow that person to, of course, hold their views, which, okay, anybody does that anyway, but that doesn't necessarily have to change, of course, that church that they go to. Of course, then, well, anyway, that doesn't have to be every church is autonomous. So, but we just have to remember that we accept uh, those around and we accept them in graciousness and humility is, is the idea. And then, of course, bring them around to what the truth is as, as, we, uh, as we meet together and we go through the, the, the word of God. So the mantra of the free church is, where is it written? Which, of course, brings about the mind of sola scriptura, the scripture alone. Where is it written? So everything that you 
you have, everything that you believe needs to come from, of course, the Word of God. And that is what our authority is. Uh, I think, however, this biblical sufficiency has a different viewpoint that's developed among the Evangelical Free Church leadership and many of the pastors as well. And this is where I differ with them. So my difference is, of course, the pragmatism that they're practicing and the uh, biblical sufficiency that they will say they believe wholeheartedly, and yet uh, by their actions they they show it's not the kind of biblical sufficiency that at least I, I view is, is correct. So um, why have I left the EFCA? I will uh, kind of get into that now. Um, and, and, and I've just said it, it's biblical sufficiency and pragmatism, but it has to do with the source of what informs me and what informs them in their practice. So um, I believe, as, as I think you realize, uh, that, uh, the, that um, biblical sufficiency is, is uh, biblical, being biblical or going to the word of God and believing the word of God is sufficient for all of life practice. And I've come to believe that from the evidence, they do not. And so I'm going to kind of go through that, e that evidence. And, and when I say pragmatic, let me kind of define that too. Uh, I, I mean, a pragmatic approach is one that's intended to sort of woo people to Christ by making the gospel embraceable by the lost in answer to their needs. Uh, it's to make Christ an attractive alternative. And on the face of it, it's not an issue of, of bringing the gospel or the good news of his death and resurrection and glory and return. That's there. There's the structure of the gospel that's there, of course. But it's a matter of acting as though it is by our efforts and uh, that people are, are, are overcome with this attraction and that we're the ones that are being the architects and the enablers of the lost being brought into the kingdom. And uh, worse, this extends to discipling. Uh, while some may say all the right words uh, of believing God for these things, the, the practice speaks to something different. It is what is practice that seems to make the gospel less than it is, and to end up being the means to pollute the stream of, of believing disciples. So what's my evidence? <laughs> Well, I began with the social justice thing. And uh, did you have any questions before we go on there? John? No, I think you're on a good roll here. And uh, I, I think the sequence you're choosing to go down is, is perfect. So, yeah, please keep going. All right. So I began with the social justice system. And, uh, of course, it was fighting racism with racism. And then uh, I went into the feminist system or what's, the, what's become that. We started to have now women pastors. Uh, I've looked at the shameful silence of the leadership and uh, that they've had with other EEFC pastors, and we'll go into that too, who, who begged for answers in writing, but they were ignored to the point that they and their churches left. And, and the cry from the EEFC leaders against Christian nationalism, which actually is against certain people who are Christian nationalists, and we'll get into that, but they would then be pushing their form of Christian nationalism, which would be from the leftward side. Uh, and then the promotion of the godless teaching, of course, uh, with uh, non-EFC conferences uh, being offered and supported by them uh, financially as well and sending people there. These conferences that are not EFCA conferences, but are just horrendous ones. And uh, therefore, uh, through their support of it, they're, they're acting in, in uh, disregard of what they say they believe. So uh, much of this is in my letter that I uh, wrote. There's my uh, cover letter there, which um, in which I tell them that I differ in sufficiency of scripture. And then I explain it why in about seven pages. And then I have two pages of references to that. And, um, and so just to start, I was assured by many that there were no woke uh, people in the, in the national leadership nor in the district, the 17 districts and that uh, make up uh, EV free. And remember EV free is, is a uh, autonomous kind of thing. So supposedly the national does not have authority over the churches, um, but um, by their teaching, of course, they're exercising 
the authority of bending the will towards what their, their teaching is. And so therefore they're kind of growing in, in, in a certain kind of power and they're pushing things through the national organization and limiting others who would say, no, wait, this is not right. And uh, so they're limiting it to people that they want to uh, push along. And, and so that has been a problem. And that's what uh, brought, brings us to this whole thing of them saying that they are not woke and now there are any of the district superintendents. That's just simply flat out not true. Uh, our national leadership promotes things like this. The, the cross and racial reconciliation. Jarvis Williams, I'm sure you're familiar with Jarvis Williams. He's an SBA. Yeah, yeah he's a false teacher. Yeah. Um, he's a false teacher. But that's interesting. So when you say that they were promoting it, um, it, it was it in an official capacity? Was yeah. it posted on their Facebook? Like how? So that's on their website then? This is on their website. Oh, okay. As evangelicals more broadly and yep. as the EFCA more specifically or people of the book where yep. it is written and then they promote him. So okay. I, I'm not saying anything they're not saying. You can go to their website. You'll find this this talk, you'll find this statement then. Um, that is an audio uh, audio thing. You can listen to it, download okay. it, listen to it. Uh, here, uh, I just uh, looked up um, Jarvis Williams, things that he's written, right? Oh, yeah. Of yeah. course, uh, he, he, he writes and, and says um, that, uh, um, well, he redefines critical race theory to include uh, uh, all the groups of the others and the others being, um, it's not just uh, people of color or, or something of that nature. It has to do with, even if you're male or it's another group and a female, Jew, Gentile, so forth, all these different things, yeah. slavery, slavery free, he considers as um, a part of racial uh, um, reconciliation, reconciliation that we need yeah. to have. Now, our district superintendent uh, stayed over, a district over in, in Kansas, uh, writes this, and I'll just quote it in, uh, on March 11th, 2021, in his article, his name is Colby Kisner, he's the, mis the Midwest District Superintendent, of whom we're told none of are woke. But he writes an article about white privilege, and he says, quote, I think it's fair to say that the incarnate Jesus had all kinds of privilege even if one doesn't care for the term itself, that included uh, an ethnic privilege in certain contexts, but also gender, lineage, righteousness, access to the Father and the Spirit, and of course, divinity. It's not a question of whether or not he had something called privilege, but what he did with it, he used his privilege to give privilege to others without guilt. So, then he put out other resources that are woke from pastors with the districts. And I'm just, I look at this and I'm going, okay, Jesus had a ethnic privilege. Did he communicate that to us? Was that given without guilt? No, he didn't communicate uh, his gender to us. I mean, there's male and female still. He didn't communicate his lineage to us. I'm not of a tribe of, you know, Judah. Uh, righteousness, yes. Access to the Father by the Spirit, sure. But he did not communicate his divinity to us. So to use the idea that he communicates things to us by his privileges means, of course, that uh, we're communicating stuff, but we then have to delineate what he does and what he does not. And so it's not a biblical approach. It's a pragmatic approach. Our ESA president, uh, Kevin Complin, then, um, he's the, he is our president or was mine but he's the president of EFCA and uh, he's representative of course of our leadership and and he has not public acknowledged his woke statements are are his resources uh, or what he finds objectionable when challenged on it by those who question him what they do do is they repeat we're not woke and it's a cover that's not a resolution so let's move on to then some other things concerning social justice. And here is where uh, I'll follow mostly what I have in my, my uh, letter, but I will show you what's, what's said here. We have a, a Greg Strand. He's sort of like the resident theologian for the EV Free. He also is over all the um, 
ordination aspects of the evangelical free church, uh, examining the doctrine of men and things of this nature for ordination. Um, he, uh, he writes uh, in his Juneteenth, uh, Juneteenth article here, uh, he, he talks about, uh, of course, listening, learning, loving. He goes into uh, standpoint epistemology, um, and he talks about lamenting. He says in there, I'll just kind of quote this, we call our nation to lament, to repent. And, um, and then my thing is, is he's calling us to do this, but he's saying that these things as though we have not objectively done so. And I believe our nation has repented of, of uh, the, the sin that they had in terms of slavery and, and um, uh, racial uh, prejudice. Go ahead. Is there anything concrete that like when you repent, you're changing, uh, you're, you're sw diametrically opposed to the direction you were going. So you you turn around and you, you go the opposite way. So what, what is exactly, I mean, is there anything he, he puts in there as far as his recommendation to, to churches uh, on what they should be doing in order to repent? Or is it just yes, it's listen and and of course it is to uh, he'll they'll call us to a a repentance of um, lament. He called us all together to lament. So just get to get together, feel bad about it, you know. <laughs> well, and... there's that, and they're saying that we have not objectively repented of this ever, and he's wrong. Yeah, uh, we. Ins well, if it's Juneteenth, I... it's talking about he's talking about slavery. I mean, that's what that's about. Yes. So. Yes. It, so, so what do you, I mean, if, if there's a, is there a guy in your congregation that owns slaves? I don't think so. Like, so it, it's, it, I, I find this a lot. It, it's not just him, but it's like a lot of denominations where they make these statements. Um, Jarvis Williams, to his credit, will tell you what you ought to do. And it's, he has a whole list of things that he expects churches to do. But most of the time it, it it's just lament, listen, there, there's really nothing concrete you can do. Um, except just feel really guilty about it, apparently. And I guess Jesus doesn't come into it anywhere to, to absolve you of this guilt. Um, so, so it ends up being just a, a manipulative tool that's, that's wielded to, uh, for political purposes, really, to, to neutralize um, uh, anyone who would stand against BLM or CRT or any of that. And that's so, so it sounds to me like that's what's going on in the EV free church as well. The same thing that's going on in so many other denominations. It's just mm -hmm. it's rhetoric without any actual biblical grounded um, action actions that can be taken. And it's just an accusation. And it's what the devil does. Accuser of the brother, just an accusation, but without any way of getting uh, rid of that uh, accusation or, or the, the guilt that comes along with it. So. We do move in, if I go past Greg Strand now, we do move into another Juneteenth article that they have. Oh, more than one, okay. Is, uh, yes, uh, in fact, this is a repeated kind of thing, but this is Alexandro Mendes. He goes by Alex Mendes, uh, and he is a actual uh, director, or, or, or he's on staff at our national office, at the national office for the ESDA. And I think it's in uh, uh, church planting. And uh, so he writes these things, and I'll tell you that he does give some specifics here. Uh, he says, uh, even today, we see the ramifications of the injustice that followed the Emancipation Proclamation and Juneteenth. Systems of injustice continue to limit the freedoms of minorities. Our present cultural realities have revealed with greater clarity how unjust practices are still embedded deep within the fabric of American society. So this is something that we are just told. There's no um, counter argument that's allowed here uh, that goes on within the national setup. So racism in the past uh, as white and black uh, uh, is still a, a offensive thing that's going on today. And that's without offering the evidence or, or, or proof of that. So then here he gets to some actions. He says, um, under we believe that God created Adam and Eve in his image. Um, he said this should cause us to hurt when we see life wasted. Sure. Who disagrees with that? 
And then he says, slavery inherently devalued the image of God present in every human life, even today. So now he goes from that time to now. We do not value the image of God as seen in the lives of people of color. I'm sorry, I do. And all the pastors that I know do. All the EV free churches that I've ever been in, seen in, heard of, or had rough shoulders with, do. They, 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 they see the image of God in, in everyone. Um, but he says we don't. He says when police take the lives and dignity of black men and women, we should grieve and lament. He doesn't point out. Well, in the lives of black women and men who, who um, weren't criminals or hadn't done something wrong or weren't threatening the lives of the police officers or any of the circumstances that surround these kinds of things, that's left off. It's all that no matter if it's just that the person is black, the officer is guilty. Right. That's a problem, as you well know. So... And then he says this, and this is a socialist goal that we get out of this. Remember not to exploit laborers. Uh, so he tells us work for better jobs, for better housing for all. Call and or email your local representatives and tell them to fight for housing and wages. And then he goes on to a more of a Christian narrative from there. So it's not like, uh, and I, I just kind of point this out, this this also bleeds into the Christian nationalist idea that the EV free church leadership seems to have in, in even in writing is that if you have sort of a leftist socialist view, that's the right view to have. But when they talk about Christian nationalism, they have for years now been just saying disparaging Christian nationalists. And then when you go, what's a Christian nationalist? Um, I think basically what they mean by Christian nationalism is someone who is maybe a conservative or on the right, or whatever they want to call it. Um, Trump would actually be a Christian nationalist from their perspective. And there's lots of uh, downness on that. But uh, the, the, the side that would be more conservative and say, hey, you know, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Uh, that would be. Christian nationalism from their perspective and is very much disparaged while their form of Christian nationalism is uplifted. So it's, it's just like racism to fight racism. There's Christian nationalism to fight Christian nationalism. Uh, it just doesn't, it never works. There's another article by um, Alexandro Mandis, the same guy called owning America's history of injustice. And of course, what he says in there is that we are to own up to the sins of our grandparents and our parents. It's like Ezekiel 18 doesn't exist. Anymore. Yeah. And most of the time I'll note that they, I mean, even talking about like um, how we deny the image of God today and that that was uh, just, just making a broad brush that like, that, that was like everyone who was a slaveholder must have done that. I mean, I, I get nervous about that kind of thing, because if you, if you go back into your New Testament and you start doing that, you st you're going to be, and even the Old Testament, actually, you start doing that to men who were called faithful and who were even how, you know, letting the early church meet at their home and stuff. And um, it's like, it's not like the Bible hasn't spoken on some of the topics that they're addressing, but it's like, they don't really, that it never enters into it. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it. It seems like it's, it's just whatever the current thing is that, you see yeah. out going on in the world, they just want to like strap their caboose to it. And how can we be part of this as well? And, and that probably fits into the uh, critique you're making of the pragmatism. There, there's just yeah. not a lot of biblical thinking behind this. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I, I, that is disturbing. Actually, as you were doing that, I went to their website uh, and they have a whole blog section and, and, and you're right. Like they're, I, I didn't even realize that, um, the evangelical free church had th this section, but th there's a lot of different ethical issues that they weighed in on. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it, it's discouraging to see that this, you know, the same thing that's affecting um, so many of the other large Christian denominations, organizations is happening um, there as well. And so, um, so, so you're talking about it, you're concerned about it. I mean, have you, have you had any positive interactions or um, has it mostly been, just a denial that, oh, no, you, you, we're not doing any of this. We're, we're not going that direction you're saying we are. 
there's some positive interactions. Uh, the latest blog that came out, for example, uh, was Kevin Capellan, the president, who was, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the pastor who did this blog. I can't recall his name offhand. It's the latest one that I read. But uh, he uh, made a lot of good statements in there, very positive things. And, um, and uh, so Kevin attached his comments on the front, you know, how we're supportive of this. And it actually was a very good block. Uh, but I will say that, um, not but, I will say also that there's a lot of good in the EFCA. I, I, I don't want to disparage the EFCA like it's black. It, uh, it's wholly dark. It is, um, it is not, it is, uh, there's light in the ESCA. There's a lot of good things. And I could say a lot of good things about them and I have, uh, but that's not what this part is about. It's just to address the things that are so dangerous as to undercut uh, both uh, disciple, uh, discipling people and uh, even evangelizing folks. So, um, if, if we can move on from social justice, I'll go to women. Sure, yeah, please, yeah. Because uh, I don't want to carry this on for too long, but nonetheless, uh, we have um, we have here uh, the, the, the another light bulb that went off for me, and that is uh, that we, uh, well, women in leadership, we have um, now women pastors in the EFCA, and it is a very crafty thing that took place to get them to this point. And it is a uh, crafty thing that's going to continue to go on. Unless it's in, and this one is, they are very much so entrenched into. You, you said that was a big it. tent in, in, in the, but, but that was something that wasn't from the ground floor. They weren't allowing women pastors than it sounds like that this is a new thing. They'll point to um, in earlier history of EB Free. They'll point to uh, some gals that were ordained. Uh, I think it used the word um, very loosely so many years ago, back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Okay. And they would use that. Uh, they have one or two examples uh, doing some sort of missions work. And uh, and yet, when the 1950, when we became a, a uh, and it's not a denomination. They'll get mad if you say that. So you've got to say movement. Uh, denomination, there's uh, less autonomy. But uh, people say it's just a, a movement. Although I think it's moved into being a denomination. But nonetheless, this is what is going on. Is um, using uh, certain examples um, and uh, causing that to be overshadowing what what EV Free actually believed. And in by 1988, we had a, a conference. Uh, which very clearly delineated that we are complementarian in our practice in the EV Free Church, because that is what the Bible taught in the practice of the church. And it is what the scriptures taught. Uh, however, the doors started being open, saying, well, yes, this is what the scripture teaches, and we're complementarian, but you know what we could do? Let's, uh, let's, we're a big tent. So therefore, let's let people who don't agree with that, egalitarian pastors, be ordained in the EV Free Church as long as they don't promote egalitarian issues. Well, what could go wrong? So this is what happened. Uh, and I will go through that now with them, with this woman in leadership and, and another one that will come about after that if I can find my place here and what I wrote. <laughs> um, and if I can't, I can just do it almost from memory anyway. Okay, this woman in leadership uh, article that, that you can have, and I'll set that one to the side. Um, it's from January of 2020. And, um, and he progresses us in our obedience to the word of God in a certain manner. So what, what, uh, what has gone on is... Um, um, in, to me in this craftiness is we have uh, flipped where we were into a completely different thought pattern, which is a pragmatic thought pattern and is against what I would see as biblical belief sufficient. Um, we're well past that line, I think, when we um, uh, depart um, from 
from, from the word. And we start um, entering into, well, the oxymoronic issue of women as pastors. Uh, when was this line crossed? Uh, I've already talked about that, but we really did cross it even further in 2012 with another conference. And um, when we uh, did then authorize these egalitarian you know, men to become pastors, and it was crafty then. It was a pathway to lead mm -hmm. towards what we're going towards. And so the progression of this craftiness has been brought to us now in the article I just showed you. And, and I'm going to actually simply use his words, and I will quote from him, and maybe that'll be uh, helpful for you. Um, he indicates that many women in the EFCA feel their gifts are not used well and that they often struggle to find their place. They long for the recognition of their gifts and abilities. And what is it that they desire? Uh, we are assured that it's not ordination uh, because we still don't ordain, ordain women, but they desire to use their leadership and teaching gifts to build up the church, but without distinction. They wanna advance the mission of the EFCA as they live in obedience to the teaching of the scriptures Obedience to the teaching of the scripture sound good, but sounding good and being good, these are my words here, differ. So now quoting him, quote, many women in the free church across the country have significant leadership positions in the workplace, in other words, in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yet feel their leadership gifts have limited value and application in the local church. Certainly, there are opportunities within the ministries where women have traditionally led such as women's and children's ministries, unquote. They have been able to lead and, and teach, of course, other women and, and children, but uh, that's not good enough. Uh, he says that all is well with that, but, quote, not all women have an interest in or an aptitude for these ministries. In other words, unquote, uh, they don't really care to teach other women only or, 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 or children. They want to broaden well, there's only other one place to go, right? And that is to clue that they can exercise authority and teach over men as well. So that's where he goes. That's what they want. And um, so we're looking into how can we transform the EFCA churches in order to skirt what we apparently affirm to be the teaching of the word of God and complementarianism, uh, but now to cross the line and affirm women can preach and teach and, um, and eventually get obtained. Uh, so here's how they're, they're working that out. Um, they're doing the same thing that the Southern Baptist Convention has really come up against with Rick Warren. Uh, not yet in ordination, but what he started it out with, and that is differentiating the, uh, the function and the office of being pastor as though you can make that different. And uh, so he does that too. Quote, there is both a prescriptive and descriptive dimensions to this within the evangelical free church. Prescriptively, we are complementarian based on the 1988 EFCA conference decision on ordination outlined in, quote, ministerial credentialing in the evangelical free church of America, unquote. Still quoting him though. The conference specified ordination in the EFCA as being available only to men and primarily, although no exclusive, not exclusively, focused on the role of senior pastor in the local churches and those in the pastoral ministry whose primary responsibility is preaching and teaching the word. Mm -hmm. Now, un unquote. He said, if you listen to it, I read it, but if you listen to it, uh, he is saying this uh, role for ordination is, is, is only for senior pastor and those in pastoral ministry. So both in the office and the function here. And uh, then he goes on, and I'll quote him, says, thus, quote, this role of senior pastor in the EFCA is a role reserved for men, unquote. Well, he just snipped out the other pastors on his own. And uh, so now all of a sudden it's not, for all pastors and elders, it's for just mm -hmm. the senior ones. Just the senior, yeah. It's the senior. 
uh, as is written here, uh, for those in pastoral ministry, preaching and teaching the word, that's no longer the case. So he writes prescriptive and descriptive. He divides them uh, as though we can have a function of the of, uh, difference between, of course, the office and, uh, and its function. We have to say that shepherding is now open to women as a function. And, um, and of course, when you do that, even though the office is not open to them, uh, you now open them up to be pastors. And what did come on as a light bulb moment for me as well is when I opened up my, uh, what's called the Pulse, that's our district uh, um, quarterly letter that goes out. It has all the churches in there and you can pray for them. And so it lists all the staff. And on the staff of one of our churches, of course, now we have a pastor. It could be any name, Barbara, my wife's name, Denise, <laughs> uh, Cindy, whatever it is, but it's, it's, a, it's a gal. And, um, and, and this is the first time in our district, but the, it's been in Eastern and Western districts already. And so now it's just is, uh, kind of spreading out. So of course, what Egalitarians will do is push this until the, the large churches <clears throat> with large budgets uh, either have to be tossed from the ESCA when they eventually do ordain women, vis-a-vis -vis Rick Warren and the SBC. Right. Um, but will they get tossed? And I didn't see him get tossed. Well, yeah. that, a question I was going to ask is the, the doctrine. I mean, is there anything in their doctrinal statement that can really, are they directly contradicting it? Or are they going to have to change it somehow? Because this hasn't taken place on that kind of a level yet, but it's just kind of, I mean, where are they at? It sounds like it's in transition and, and it could go that direction, but it's kind of um, subversive at this point. To complicate things, they have a statement of faith. A statement of faith is, is, is a creed, is a um, systematic theology, is a confession, Westminster Confession, 1689, London Baptists, all these things are systematic theologies, right? There are, there are statements where we reduce down in a systematic way what we believe the scripture is teaching. Mm -hmm. They have a, a, a short statement uh, or, or creed or whatever you want to call it uh, of um, what we you have to believe to be a, 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 an evangelical free person. Uh, it's very vanilla. It's just typical, you know, Trinity cross, things of this nature, Holy Spirit. Uh, but we have uh, this um, separate uh, statements that are not the same as what you have to believe, but things that, that are recognized as true within the EB3. It's our spiritual sort of statements. That's pretty extensive. And in there, it starts to argue different things. And, and that's where we we go off on, and right now we're still complementarian, but uh, that obviously is is uh, on its way out the window, and it's gotcha. on its way out because he argues, and I'll show that in just a moment, that he's really pushing for egalitarianism throughout all the churches. All right, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it did. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sure. No problem. Okay, so he says, quote, however, it is important to note that in addition to the certificate of ordination, which is available only to men, the EFCA does offer a permanent certificate of Christian ministry credential, which is available to both women and men. Mm. Descriptively, we are complementarian. He had just written in the paragraph above, prescriptively, we are complementarian, but he just puts it in a different category now. But going on with the quotation, in that uh, most ESA churches conclude that biblical texts teach the roles of elder and senior pastor are reserved for men. Based on that, which is the complementarian view, based on that understanding and application of the biblical text, it is encouraging to see a significant and growing number of our churches, which, by the way, are complementarian, right, in terms of their supposed to be understanding, it's, in, it's encouraging to see a significant and growing number of our churches seeking ways to expand opportunities for women 
to effectively use their gifts and abilities to lead and teach within the church. I mean, wow. Know the way to take that. Right. I, you know, I, to me, that's clear enough. Just double speak. I mean, it's, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's opposite world. It's upside down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, it reminds me of when Jesus went after the Pharisees so often for hypocrisy, and that's what this is. It's just you're saying one thing, so you kind of have like a safety if someone challenges you. You say, no, look, I said we're complementarian, but then it's like, yeah, but over here, you you totally contradicted what you said over here. Um, it, it's amazing they think that they can get away with stuff like that, but but then they do. So He did. He has. He still is. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm saying that to me, it's I think of it as a snake. Uh, the whole thing is 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 uh, craftiness, you know. It's 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 a pragmatic approach. All right. So I'll go on and and uh, and say that now our Christian certificate of Christian ministry includes the opportunity for women to lead and teach. It's not what these things are intended for, but so it's not restricted just to other women and 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 and, and children. It's, it goes on. So what does this mean? Quoting him now. This means. More churches are hiring women to serve in a variety of ministry roles and including women in various leadership positions. In our polity, beyond the conference position of an ordination and the role of senior pastor, you notice he doesn't say all, Mm -hmm. the local EFCA churches have the right and the responsibility to determine their understanding of the biblical texts related to women and leadership in their church and how to live that out on in their local ministry context, unquote. Well, that, that's more dangerous than any other sentence, because then what do you say? You know, every local church should determine their view of the incarnation or their view of the Trinity. Or, I mean, that's stupid. <laughs> well, th- those things are, are, remember that statement of faith? Those are excluded. Yeah. Because that's called the primary uh, phys- issue. There okay, are, I got you now. These are, seem to be a secondary issue with them. So not to me. I think it's primary because it, it, it affects your biblical sufficiency. But nonetheless, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So, um, so he's he, he goes on and 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 um, and says then uh, uh, it, the means that the EFCA churches will have varying understandings, and that's what it means. It is extremely important that we exercise grace and humility toward one another, and not make right and wrong judgments, in other words, to me, biblical judgments, related to how congregations determine their local leadership structure and practices, unquote. So I I cannot say he means anything else except for he wants to promote egalitarian views beyond our current polity. And Mm -hmm. that's what he's doing. So what is that going to look like? Quoting him again. For example, uh, Some churches choose to align title pastor only to the men on their ministry staff, while other churches give the title pastor to ministry staff, both women and men. And here we are. That's what I'm saying. Unquote. So continuing with the quote here, those using the title pastor for only male ministry staff base their positions on New Testament terms, overseer, elder, pastor, shepherd as referring to the same leadership office in the church, which is reserved for men. In this case, they choose not to give female ministry staff the title pastor to avoid confusion, unquote. Avoid confusion? I'm worried about avoiding confusion. No, Uh, I'm not worried about avoiding confusion. That is, like we were saying, that's opposite world talk. I'm concerned to be precise with the teaching of the word of God so as to not create confusion. But he is creating confusion so that we can be transferred, be made to change into a transformational church. We'll talk about that too in a moment. Transformational church who is able to sidle up with this world and make the gospel more attractive because we don't have any issue that we have to fight about concerning women. That's what I think is going on. And it seems pretty clear to me anyway. So uh, going to his thing again, um, uh, we have permission, you know, for him to entitle women as pastors, quote, thus they may use the title pastor for both female 
and male ministry staff, unquote, crafty. In his uh, developing female leaders toward fulfillment of our mission, this is another blog of his. It's a later one. In fact, this one is uh, more uh, recent, I believe. Uh, this is, um, I don't know what, I don't have a date on here, but this is a more recent one. Well, anyway, in this one, uh, he says, uh, Is oh, it developing it? female leaders, you said, towards fulfillment? Developing female leadership towards fulfillment of our mission. It's dated no. November 9th, 2021. Yep, yep. I got the date. Yep. Okay, thank you. So uh, Kevin Compellin brings up that transformational church model. Actually, I just mentioned that. And what he means by that, what he has in mind. Uh, and, and, and we used to have a saying, um, and that saying was that we are, the EFCA exists to glorify God by multiplying churches among all people. Well, now he's put in a different um, uh, descriptor. Uh, he, he, he says the EFCA exists to glorify God by multiplying transformational churches among all people. What's he mean by that? Whatever he means by it, of course, it's something different than that had existed. You transform from one thing to another, right? Right. So um, to effectively live out this mission, quoting him, we need to recognize and acknowledge the gifts, abilities, perspectives, and roles of both women and men in the EFCA. When we honor and affirm each other's gifts, respect and listen to each other's perspectives and champion biblically appropriate ways to serve together, we strengthen church's effectiveness in our mission. Again, unquote. Again, he is justifying with adjectives like biblically and appropriate. He'll use those words, biblically appropriate, to say that we need to champion things that are unbiblical and inappropriate to strengthen the church's effectiveness in our mission. This is my statement here. So here's the three things he says. Here's three steps for the women for, for doing this transformational process. And you know what this is. This is critical theory. Whatever mm -hmm. you put between the C and the T is what you're trying to destroy. And this is, you're, you're trying to destroy complementarianism. So you're, you're putting that in there. Well, here's how you do it. First, identify and encourage female leaders in your church. Find women who love the word, who are godly and faithful and steadfast and have a shown leadership in a church ministry. You know, that describes my wife. My wife is godly and she is, she is faithful and she is steadfast. She leads this woman's ministry we have in our church by teaching the women and she will teach children too. And, uh, but if you want to talk about someone who's biblical and godly, she would never never do what, what we're being told to do here. So mm -hmm. let's just go on with that. Find these women. This may seem simple, but it's an essential step in this process. But what kind of women are we really trying to find? Two, intentionally find opportunities for women to serve in leading and teaching within your understanding of what the scriptures in your local church affirm. So do it what your local church affirms, but what does he want to, the local church to affirm? He wants them to go into egalitarian mode. So in other words, your church ought to affirm what he indicated in the previous article. So quoting him again, in many cases, we're just not opening the doors for gifted women to lead. Whatever the position for these leaders, create pathways for opportunities and bring women into those roles. Three, include women in the conversation. We need, un un and let me unquote there and just insert a little thought, of course, we need, we need to change our epistemological viewpoint to include Eve's perspective, right? Let's get her perspective on, on, on this. And uh, so here's what he says. Include them in a conversation, quote, with humility and grace, invite women to be part of a healthy dialogue in a church about where women can serve, how to cultivate their gifts, and what the church can do to support them, unquote. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, <laughs> I don't know that, that you need to even add much commentary. It, it just is obvious that um, he wants to push things in a egalitarian direction, and he's not really hiding it. No, not to me. I think it's pretty clear. Yeah. So we could be done with that issue because I think I've said enough. 
uh, it, I think I've yeah. given enough evidence to show where I got where I got to. On yeah, that. so you're seeing this stuff um, come out of the denomination through their through really blogs, through statements on the website. Um, it's not like they're convening a whole gathering to 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 say, uh, you know, we, we've determined now this is our new position and, and being very open about it. It's it's all subversive kind of gradual steps in, in a certain direction. And then you wake up one day and it's like, hey, how did all these women pastors get in here? You know, or or like, why, why are we, um, you know, all of a sudden all BLM supporters or something like it doesn't happen overnight um, through some kind of a biblical argument and everyone gains a new conviction. It happens through stuff like this over time. And um, and so were there other issues, too, that you wanted to talk about that, that concerns you or were those the main ones? There's a couple of other issues. I'll be as quick as I can about those and just to conclude it up here. But basically, I wanted to demonstrate that I'm just not the only one that's struggling with this or was struggling with this in the ESCA. Uh, there's been many others. And uh, some of them have left, their churches left. They've turned in their, their you know, certificates of ordination and that kind of stuff. And uh, so, um, and also the church's membership. So I just want to, I'll just use one example of that. And then I'll finally conclude with an example of um, uh, a, a man who's going through the ringer here. And, uh, Please, and yeah. who is a EUFCA pastor uh, who may not be for long. So last um, fall of 2019, Pastor Rob Bernowski of Desert Hills, um, Evangelical Free Church at the time, uh, actually November 5th, uh, he wrote a letter, uh, he and his church letters wrote a, leaders wrote, wrote a letter to the EFCA and to the pastors, uh, warning them about something that they were doing and saying, this is, ought not to be the case. What are, you, what are you doing? And what it was was a mosaic uh, church conference. Are you familiar with Mosaic Church? I have heard of, of it, but I am not. Too, yeah, Mark, why don't you let know, the audience know yeah. since I don't even have a basic familiarity. Okay. So, um, but, but basically, uh, it's it's way out there. <laughs> okay. Mark uh, De Yemas, I think is his name, and his wife, um, pastoring these things. But anyway, uh, they had a conference and uh, he, he writes, uh, this is the uh, first letter that he writes. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, I can send this to you too. Uh, but he writes in there that um, they were very troubled by the EFCA's partnership with this conference. And yes, you would be troubled. I'm not going to read all of it, but just some specific points here. Uh, he brings out what they're concerned about. First of all, it was women in leadership. Um, they, they had um, women leading the sessions. And the first session was on women leadership. Oh, man. And uh, there's a uh, Stachy uh, Duran who had the title of lead pastor, which is, of course, what we would probably call senior pastor. She's leading it. And this is, this is something that the Evangelical Free Church took funds from the churches and supported this conference, being a, uh, a supporter of the conference directly with money and also sending people there like Alex Lindez, who wrote what we talked earlier on in social justice and owning American and, and that kind of thing. He went there as well. So they're all there uh, and they're going to be hearing these things. Uh, there's another gal, Georgiana de la Moya, Moya, Moya I, I'm probably going to slaughtering the name, I suppose, but she is the co-lead pastor at Cornerstone Church. And, um, and then the biggest concern uh, of the group was Grace uh, G. Zun Kim. Kim, I'm probably not pronouncing that well enough as well either, but her second book is entitled The Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, well, I say Kai because I do the Greek, but maybe it's Chai, I don't know. But Kai and um, another, a model of global and intercultural pneumatology. Now, this is a thing that's promoting Christians to be, quote, open to the cultural, spiritual, and religious understanding of the East. It's chi. Uh -huh. It's chi. That's it's the chi force. Yeah, it's okay. that's pagan, the Eastern religion, mysticism. Okay. Yeah. 
Jeez. That's crazy to me. That's uh, that they had a session on that. So, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they want to unite spiritual ideas in Christianity with those of Confucianism, Hinduism, Tao, uh, Taoism, and Buddhism. You, yeah. you get that from Wikipedia. All right. So these are these concerns that they have a little bit more uh, really gets to the LBGDQ. And we're just going to touch lightly on that because uh, the EV free church at currently says that um, uh, LBGTQ, this is sin. To practice this is sin. There's, there's, no, there's, no un, there's no ambiguity about that. But then there's an additional thing here, and that is that we should be welcoming of homosexuals. Well, what does that even mean? And I think what it means is this to them, EV free, is that we need to welcome same-sex attracted individuals. And not that they practice this, we don't welcome their practice, but we welcome them even in their same-sex attraction, which to me is saying that um, what Jesus said concerning lust uh, can be going out the window. It's okay to be selling same self attracted. You're nothing especially wrong with you. It's just something that you have to deal with. But maybe it doesn't really push dealing with it. You know, it's not like let's go ahead and mortify the flesh. Not only the actions, but the, the attitudes and thoughts of the flesh that come into you to, like Jesus would talk about lust, um, this would be perverted lust, uh, but another, just, just to be welcoming, uh, non-condemning, and I, and I just, uh, the point is, is that we are to love people who are of the world, and we also love people who are struggling with their sin. And if their homosexual identity, which they had in the past before coming to Christ, when they came to Christ, their identity changed. And so now we deal with them as believers who are struggling with sin. There's a big difference. Uh, we're not trying to promote any acceptance of that. We're trying to help them in their struggle to mortify the flesh. We all do. We all have our struggles. And uh, that's one that we do too. So there's just sort of a bit there that's starting. And, you know, if you're on the hilltop and it's all snow and you start that bent, it, you just are going to slide. And, yeah. and that's what the concern is there. I'm not going to go any further than that. But they had all these LBGTQ people and they're promoting it as a legitimate lifestyle for Christians. So they say the EFCA leadership states that we are not moving in this direction, but it tragically they say with their words, what they say with their words is contradicted by what the ESC is doing with our financial resources, recommendations, and promotions. So that's what this letter does here. Uh, and they write that as a warning. And then what happens is that started that day that they wrote it and went on for a week. And then they wrote another letter saying, sure enough, this is all this is what happened. And that's their letter. This is what happened there. And I won't go through too much of this either, but they said, uh, Look, these are false teachers. The Mosaic Conference invited people who are false teachers to be speakers and leaders of various sessions. Um, it is unbiblical and therefore unacceptable for spiritual leaders within the church, within the EFC church, the, our leadership, to partner with false teachers in sponsoring a conference for several reasons. First, spiritual leaders are not to partner with deceivers, but to expose their fa false teaching. He goes into scripture. Second, the New Testament frequently warns the church about false teachers and the danger they pose to the mission of the gospel. He goes into all those kinds of things, too. Uh, and, and he goes on and gives certain examples. And here he gets to um, someone who writes while they're at the conference there. What an honor to share the platform with these powerful women of God at the Mosaic Conference. Pastors. Michelle Higgins, Susie Gamas, oh, Gamas, Gamas, I don't know, Noemi, whatever her name is, Chavez, they can preach, man, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and then it goes on, and, and, and the, the, the founder and the organizer, which is Mark, um, uh, 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 Deimis, uh, he writes, in juxtaposition to a white pastor's recent comment telling another woman to go home, the question is to ask, which one is the real prophet? My answer to money is on our dear sister, you know, Rich Beth Moore. Uh -huh. And uh, he, he just complains about uh, John MacArthur, calling him a white pastor kind of thing, which, of course, 
here's a faithful man reduced to the color of his skin, right? Not um, uh, 50 years of ministry. And, well, he goes on and just kind of complains about that, just points this kind of stuff out too. There's a dissent here, but let me finish with this last one. He's quoting now Alex Mandis. Remember Alexander Mandis, only American, all the stuff in social justice? He went. He was, by funds from the churches, he was paid to attend and go there. And he's also on the national board, you know, national directors, at least on the staff there. He tweets, quote, at multi-ethnic church planting conference in Dallas, there is a question that came to mind. Why do we largely invest in a demographic that is becoming less and less and grudgingly resource a demographic? And he writes this in a poor manner that you can understand. He says, what will be more and more? Uh, what he does is he then links the article, it says here, showing how white populations are declining in the U.S. while Hispanic groups are rapidly increasing. And the question that comes to his mind is why are we spending so much on white people when soon there'll be a small percentage of the population? Nothing about this question reflects biblical concerns. Nothing. Wow. You know. So uh, where do we find the apostles in the New Testament accessing census data to figure out who to preach the gospel to? Yeah. So that's what they said. And then finally, uh, Six months later, they did leave the church. Uh, they became, instead of Desert Hills Evangelical Free Church, they became Desert Hills Bible Church because they had not found any other association yet to go to, which is a problem I'm looking at. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's the. You're not the only one. There's others the who one. are, and, and I know of a pastor right now who's considering it. Uh, and his church is thinking of leaving. So I don't know how widespread it is, but it does sound similar to what's happening in the SBC. Uh, and they're, they're kind of just bleeding conservative churches. And you would think that that would create in the leadership kind of a, a pause and like, hold on, we should do something. We should say something, but it doesn't sound like it is. It's just a denial and let's keep going forward. Mm -hmm. So that's sad. So last example. Please. Okay. Uh, Jeff Clear, Clear. Uh, Jeff Clear is a, a pastor with the, the EFCA. Uh, he's a good brother in Christ. He's a, he's a very humble guy from my context with him. I spoke with him, you know. But uh, he wrote this book, um, uh, Woke Free Church. He wrote it to all evangelical churches. But he did an appendix in here just to the uh, evangelical free church. And I won't read things out of this, but I will tell you what happened. Just the story here. What he did was he went to a conference thing that was 2019, I believe, spring of 2019. And who was there was Greg Strand, our sort of resident theologian, who gave a really good argument against social justice. I think that's the year. But nonetheless, he gave a really good argument against social justice. He gave a biblical argument against it, spending an hour on it. That's wonderful. So there's good things. But then he turned around, well, not turned around, but he picked out a, a, a pastor, uh, one of the black pastors in the EFCA, who happens to be woke. <laughs> and he had him come forward and speak for a half hour. And this, and it's like, Jeff was thinking, this is going to be um, a parody. Uh, it's going to be something that's going to come out and they're going to say, aha, see, gotcha, this is what this is all about. But that's not what happened. He spoke for half hour on critical theory, critical race theory, and promoted it. And at the end of that half hour, Grace Strand says, amen, amen. I agree with you. Wow. So, so he put this in here. And then um, eventually, this book got into apparently too many hands, and there was stuff going on. And here's uh, the response. And here's the unofficial response to charges that the EFCA has adopted a woke worldview. And uh, I told you before, I think they have, you know, but, uh, or at least they are pretty well nigh into allowing that to be promoted through the EFCA and they're the leaders. Um, the first question you might ask is, why did they make it official? 
but that's a different issue. Let's just go on. They write, Greg writes, in light of the discussion about Jeff Cleaver's book, The Woke Free Church, for the deliverance of the body of Christ from social justice captivity, and the claims and criticism he makes, and also the discussion occurring in broader evangelicalism, I thought it would be instructive to share with you a response to a question I had, was asked earlier in the summer, along with my response. The question is, of course, what is your position on the social justice issue? And, and what he does is he goes on his position. On his position. Um, it's not uh, too necessarily bad here. He just tries to redefine things. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into all of that. You can read it if you uh, just email me and ask. I'll send you all of the links, and you can read all these things for yourself. But, but uh, he does say some things that are concerning to me. There's a little bit of a conflation that crack that opens up between the gospel and social justice in there to me. But then Kevin uh, Capellan puts in additional remarks. And as in his additional remarks, he says this. EFCA has apparently joined the woke culture. There's a, there's a, he's quoting someone else. And then he says, um, no, he's not. I'm sorry. This is all him. EFCA has apparently joined the, joined the woke culture. He's going to try and be a little bit sarcastic back. But he says this, quote, calls for social justice are echoing within the organization. Okay. That's a flat out statement that we have a problem. Yeah. There are calls in our organization that are echoing amongst our organization that we need to go and support social justice, the world's social justice. How can the ESCA justify this? And so he goes in and he tries to uh, say some things and he goes on, but not very, very much. But basically saying we're not woke. So yeah. let me tell you what this paper <laughs> did not do. What this paper did not do was address anything written in the book that they're supposedly talking about, which is Jeff Kluwer's book. Or Jeff Kluwer's and Kluwer himself. Kluwer, I'm trying to say it right himself. Instead, this is what they do. And I'll read this and then I'll show you the paper too. It's just a very short thing. I wrote Woke Free Church for the deliverance of the body of Christ from social justice captivity. This is general speaking. It is because I love the ESCA that I was willing to lay some hard, say some hard things aimed toward correction. But I was also very careful to offer words of encouragement and affirmation to those leaders of the ESCA that I name in the book. Sadly, I have yet to receive a response. Some pastors were sent to rebuke me. He had four pastors come show up at his door. I think it's four or five, but four. Sent by the ESCA um, uh, office, uh, national office. And they were sent to rebuke me for writing the book. But no one has addressed the substance of the claims of the book. In other words, just what I said on this paper, they don't talk about what he said. They only say, we're rebuking you for writing the book. And then they give four, four things. So let me read this now. Worse still, the leadership has chosen to threaten me with being defrocked meaning they're going to take away his ordination. They're not going to wait for him to send it to him. The charges are misrepresentation, Christian nationalism, attitude, and influence. I have asked for at least one example of anything I wrote in Woke Free Church that the leadership claims to be a misrepresentation, but they have flatly refused to provide it. They, have, they, they won't name a thing. As for the second charge, I have not yet been given any definition of Christian nationalism nor examples of my teaching it, whatever it is, it is. And the other two charges are likewise hard to answer. I am praying for justice to be done. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. But if I have erred in anyone's mind, I think it is incumbent upon the ones bringing the charges to tell me where they say, I have erred. Please pray for me to have wisdom from above and dealing with situation. Well, right after that, uh, he got a letter from the ESCA uh, uh, and uh, 
uh, telling them that he is actually being defrocked this September. I don't have a copy of that one, but that's what he's, he's received. I don't understand the charge of Christian nationalism. How is that a charge? What does that even mean? I mean they just don't define it, I guess. Well, what I was telling you before, when, when I was speaking earlier about trying to define Christian nationalism, what I think they mean by Christian nationalism is if you're a conservative and you right. think that we ought to be voting for people who, not necessarily Christians or anything, but we're voting for people who will uh, uphold uh, just what's written in the heart of man by God, is the law that he writes, writes in the heart of us, so that we have some sanity and that we are uh, following uh, th things rightly and wrongly, understanding what's right and wrong by, by that even, that's just the natural revelation of God, that would be Christian nationalism to them. Mm -hmm. Rather, if they want the leftist socialist view that I see, that I showed you, that I think I demonstrated well enough right. that, for that, they want this, this kind of view. That's not Christian nationalism to them, when in fact, it's doing the same thing. Let's vote for the right people. Let's push the same agenda. Let's email our representatives. Let's do all this kind of stuff. That's not Christian nationalism, but this is. Mm -hmm. this is so to them, I think it's to effect a change in the nation to make the nation uh, more righteously Christianized is, is what I think they would define uh, Christian nationalism. And they're against it. Oh, they're just terribly against it. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. And now they don't say anything about him. So go ahead. No, that's interesting. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember, because um, I've heard of this book before, I believe. And I, as you were telling the story, I, I, I feel like um, someone had conveyed this already to me. So I, I don't know to what extent there's been uh, exposure of this, but um to me, that's kind of of all the things that you mentioned, that's that's the biggest deal in a way, just because that's where the rubber's meeting the road. They're actually it's affecting someone's life. Mm -hmm. They're they're actually um, taking some uh, an aggressive uh, position. And that is policy. Procedure is policy. When, when you start um, applying these things, that is what your denomination believes now or your organization or whatever, however you want to categorize the uh, EFCA. Um, but uh, that's kind of disturbing, to be honest. Um, and I'd be curious from you to see what advice you'd have for pastors or churches in a similar situation. Cause I would imagine if, if I'm, and all I'm doing is really letting you have a platform at my invitation, but just, Hey, share this information. Uh, I'd be curious to see what, what happens, um, with you, you know, as this video makes its rounds and then, um, others who might have concerns, you know, what would you say to them? I, mean, I don't know if you want to encourage leaving, but I mean, that, that seems to be the obvious choice, but what's, do you have anything to share as far as direction? And this is a more difficult thing and I'm not trying to be cowardly. I hope I'm not cowardly. No, uh, I don't think so. No, <laughs> but I, 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 I don't want to push people in any direction on this. What I want to do is to at least expose the truth. I, I'm all for being open. And the leadership has not, to me, been open yet. Now, Kevin Compellion is going to contact me next week and set up a time where he and I can talk to just face to face, well, Zoom to Zoom or whatever it is. And now that I have Zoom on my computer, thank you, I can do that. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, it's not like um, I am encouraging people to leave the ESA per se. I am providing, uh, I think, known facts about what is going on, if that is a cause for them to go, okay. If that is not a cause, if they think that, oh, this is all secondary issues, they don't care about women pastors, they don't care about social justice stuff, and, and they define it well enough to be biblical justice, maybe, things of that nature. Um, if they're not concerned about that, then, then they're not. And, and, well, uh, and I consider, go ahead. Yeah, but what, what's the make? Like, I, I don't understand the polity necessarily of the um, e EFCA. So, well, is there a way conservatives could band together and kind of like, you know, I don't know, get their own leadership uh, in in charge so that some of these situations resolve themselves and leadership can come back to more of an orthodox position on this? 
or is that just kind of beyond the pale? No, uh, anybody that wants to get together and talk can talk, but what has happened is the public discussion of it through the EFCA is shut down. Okay. The control of the blogs, the control of what's said, what's promoted to all the churches is, uh, is just through the EFCA and they're not allowing, and of course they're not allowing Jeff or, and there's many other pastors, by the way, that I know of um, who do meet and talk about these things. But nonetheless, um, but when do the elections, are are there elections every year to, how how would you, if you wanted to set the denomination, right, is there a mechanism by which to even do that? Or is that just not possible? Is my question. Is that a dangerous question? (laughs) No, it's not a dangerous question. It's just that I'm pretty ignorant on these kinds of things sometimes. (laughs) Oh, okay. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you like got all your friends show up at whatever the annual meeting is and then say, all right, we're voting our guy in as the new president or w- whatever the highest position is. And now, you know, we, we've taken the denomination back or we've set it right or whatever. Okay. That's, yeah. I, I, I have shown you my, my understanding is that Kevin, um, not so much Craig, uh, he's, he's, he's fence, he's fence sitting. Right. But uh, what I see with uh, the leadership of the EFCA is is either trying to fence sent or uh, sit, or they're trying to push an agenda. I think Kevin has done wrong and has been crafty, uh, and he does need to repent of this. But I do see them all as brothers, and so again, I would say this: if um, there can be a change affected by just simply acknowledging where you've done wrong and and yet there's just this cover uh and no acknowledgement of wrongdoing and 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 no repentance (laughs) is going on that uh because they don't think they need to repent and so therefore um this would be something that is incumbent upon everyone in the email preachers to at least examine and if you mm-hmm. examine it and you see from the evidence that uh, what I personally say, fine. And if you think that um, you need to leave because of that, that's fine. I'm not encouraging anyone to leave. I don't press. I understand. Forward. Okay. So I'm not encouraging my church to leave. I want them to, to think it through. And uh, if they do leave, that's fine. I know quite a few of them want, want to, but simply because. I've turned in my ordination and I'm not part of the EV free uh, church any longer. And they, they love me, they trust me, but I don't want it done on, on right. relationship. I want it done on actual facts. Yeah. And so I think I would just encourage everybody to look at the facts and they may come to a different conclusion. Than I. That's fine. Uh, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. I hear you on that. And, and that makes uh, sense. And I, um, I, I think you've done a good job presenting facts. And so this is not, uh, I'm not trying to get you to say anything you don't want to say. And, and this is totally my opinion here. But when you have leadership like this, even if they repent and acknowledge everything they've done and say, we don't want to do that anymore, uh, trust has to be rebuilt. I mean, you're talking about some in some of these situations, years now um, of uh, the wrong position being out there. And, um, and just because I, um, so someone repents and I forgive them and we're, we're back into a good relationship doesn't mean that I want them running my organization anymore. So that's something to consider that uh, there, there would, in my mind, there would have to be a time period of, of building trust here I, again. Um, so, you know, it may, you might not be the person to talk to about this, but I would wonder for those watching who are evangelical free uh, and, and you're listening and you think, man, I, I, can we affect change? You know, I would wonder what mechanism that would be, whether that's an annual meeting they have, or I, I don't know how officers are elected and stuff, but maybe um, if it's still worth it and possible, it may not be. Get some guys in there that aren't going to be fence sitters, that aren't going to be vague or general about these things, but specific and biblical, and that you can count on to, to get into some of these positions so that uh, the denomination can, can go in a better direction. I mean, that would be that would be amazing, I would think. Um, so. Yeah, and you don't need to comment on that, by the way. I just wanted to—that was sort of my two cents. I wanted like to put to out there a little bit there, though. Okay, please do. And and that is, um, there are fellows that I know of, of course, and you know some too that I don't know, 
but they're throughout the ESCA. And I, and I would just say that for me personally, and this I can say, uh, I don't think there's coming back from this. I, I think what we've done is we've entered into something that is not reversible, especially women okay. in ministry, that kind of in pastoral ministry, that kind of stuff. I don't think that's going to happen. If it does happen, I praise God. But the reason I left is because obviously I think that uh, uh, this is a, this stuff is just not redeemable to me. And and also, I'm getting a little bit older, and that's not an excuse. But I've got too much other stuff to do for bringing out the word of God and proclaiming it and teaching it and sharing it and living it out in my life. I don't have that many more years to do that with. And, and I, to spend my time, you're a young guy, John, and, 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 and you can see how it can affect you and your time to address these issues and, and uh, to go through them and to try and affect change in that way. I'm a little bit older and my time, I have to um, carve out to do what is 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 um, more beneficial, and that is, I, I don't want to into a, a fight that's going to just drag out, and and all I do is maybe not get anywhere with it. I, I really do want to uh, move on to just uh, do what God's called me to do in, in ministry. Now, for other people, uh, they may have that time. There are uh, lots of pastors, again, I will say, who are. Um, really hurting because they have not gotten any answers from the national uh, office to the questions they're asking. They're all asking the same questions I am. And, um, and they're not getting any answers. I, I know of so many. And um, so I just would uh, say that, again, I've already said my piece, but I, I just am hoping that folks, if, you, if, they, if they can't see that this is going to turn around, then go a different direction and follow what God has for you. I can't find yet a place to go. What I mean by that is, what are we going to do about ordination? Maybe nothing. <laughs> um, uh, what am I going to do about uh, what if the church wants to leave? Where are we going to go? We're, we're not lone rangers. We're, we're people who want to be associated in a greater scale. I'm wondering where are all these Southern Baptist church guys going who have left the Southern Baptist church? And this has been, and daily there's yeah. churches leaving the SBC. Where do they go? Yeah. I don't, I don't know the answer. I, I think a lot of it, they're in, independent now, or they have uh, some of them still remain in some local associations. Um, I, I know that there's different things popping up. I've heard about the fire network uh, mm -hmm. out in Colorado and, I've heard about like well the IFCA was is an organization I interviewed the president of recently. It's not for everyone, not nice. but you know that's another association that's not going woke. Um, I don't know of a lot though, uh, and, and it, we really do need more. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, and it's a curious thing. I, I don't. It's probably for another discussion sometime. But I've wondered why there hasn't been uh, cuz there's a whole market in, in a sense i'm just thinking pragmatic here like we're not not to be a pragmatist but thinking practically uh you you have a whole bunch of people who don't want to go woke in fact most of them don't in many of these organizations and their leadership is trying to take them to these places there should be tons of alternatives popping up all over the place to attract these people and yet there's there's something about intimidation the social stigma that would come if you led that. Uh, there's something about, there's a fear, there's intrepidation. I don't know exactly how mm -hmm. to make sense of all of it, but um, yeah, I, I do my best when I do hear of a good organization. I, I try to book someone to come on and talk about it. And you know, maybe someone listening to this podcast right now is that person. They need to start one that's gonna uh, do some of the functions that some of these organizations, like or ordination, uh, for mm -hmm. chaplaincy, like missions work, um, some of these things, you need a cooperative effort to actually um, pull off. So, yeah, wish I had a better answer for you. Sorry, I don't. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. th thank you for your bravery and for sharing um, about the EFCA, because I mean, you've opened my eyes. I didn't realize it was this bad. I knew that there was some stuff happening, but I, it's just um, it, it, in one sense, it's discouraging, but I'm really glad there are pastors like yourself out there. Um, and like you said, there's a pastor that even just left that from Desert Hills. 
And um, there's, uh, there's more. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot more. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the gospel is going to go forward and the Christ church is going to be built and he's not, it sounds like he, he may not be using the EFCA as much <laughs> to do that. So that's a sad thing, but, uh, we just no praise sad. God that he, he reveals the truth and that we have the truth and we, we don't need to be, um, like in the days of yore when the Catholic church was the Roman Catholic church, um, just pretty much controlled even the, the, the language and everything so that people were ignorant of this. We have the truth. Now we can compare what people are saying to what the word of God says. So praise God. Um, yeah. So anyway, so, um, well, uh, anywhere you want to send anyone or, uh, I think I asked you that at the beginning and you, you didn't really have anything, but, um, I know I'll put your email address in the info section. So yeah. any final thoughts you have? Which one did you put in? Oh, I haven't put it. Well, I, I will put your, your email address. Craig Mill at yahoo.com is, is the one I prefer. Okay. So, uh, C R A I G M E L A at yahoo.com. All right. Well, I will put that in the info section for everyone. And if you have any questions for Pastor Chambers, please um, email him at that address and he can help you out. So God bless. And I'll keep you updated. Thank you. Thank you. All right, brother. God bless. Thank you.